Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the closing session for uh, this uh, this year's uh, eighth annual small business workshop. And appreciate all of you joining us. As you know, we start each and every single week at 10 o'clock. This is our fourth and final in this series, which, by the way, has been a record year in terms of the number of registrations and participate participants and engagements we are so appreciative and again i want to take the opportunity to thank comcast for letting me do it from the studio last week we're back in the total remote environment for this last session my name is mark s we am the founder and the ceo of the lee group and we are a strategic marketing uh, consulting organization based here in metro detroit uh, I'm also a blogger for Crane's Detroit Business. I'm a media contributor. I also host a radio show here in town, as well as other things. And I'm an adjunct professor at three different universities, uh, including Eastern Michigan University, Madonna University, and Northwood as well. And we're so pleased that you're able to join us for this critical series that we've been having. And uh, what we're trying to do here is to give you the tools to be successful as we focus on the road to recovery the road to recovery. So again, thank you for joining us for this eighth annual small business workshop, which is in fact being presented by the third bank. And I'm so pleased that you're able to join us for the third year virtually as part of this series. And uh, again, this event is free. It's free because of our sponsors and all of our partners. And without them, this in fact would not be possible. So I'd like to take, thank, take this opportunity and thank our presenting sponsor, Fifth Third Bank. And uh, they've been with us from the very beginning. Very proud to say that they've been with us from the very beginning. We have grown together uh, and watched this event become certainly significant. We have over 500, over 500 engagements, which has been incredible this year. Again, close to a million impressions, a million impressions. Many people have somehow been exposed to this workshop over the last several weeks. So again, we appreciate all that Fifth Third does here in Detroit and their support for the 8th Annual. And a program like this would not be possible without them and all of our sponsors and partners as well. So let's take a moment to recognize them. Again, Fifth Third Bank, the Detroit Development Fund, Comcast Business, Build Institute in partnership with Empowered by GoDaddy, First Independence Bank, the Live Six Alliance Detroit, Michigan Women Forward, State Farm Agent Cindy Fletcher in Plymouth, Michigan, Tanner Friedman, which is a strategic marketing consulting organization, communications in Farmington Hills, Michigan, uh, Detroit's Public Television, WTVS, or Detroit Public TV, Channel 56, if you will, and of course, the Detroit Free Press, the uh, largest newspaper in the state of Michigan. Without these sponsors and partners, today's event would not be possible. And at this point, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Ms. Tanya Rose, Vice President of Community and Economic Development Manager for Fifth Third Bank, to provide a few remarks. Tanya, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your support. Well, good morning, Mark, and good morning, everyone. It's, a great, it's great to be here with all of you today and the final session of yet another engaging and successful small business workshop. It's Fifth Third Bank's pleasure to be the presenting sponsor of this event for eight years now. It's important to us as Fifth Third Bank because we believe that small businesses are the backbone of our economy and of our communities. And we wanna make sure that small businesses have the tools and resources they need to be successful. Today's final session is sure to provide relevant and timely information for all participants, just as the previous three sessions have. Thanks in advance to Angelina and Michelle for sharing your advice and expertise and wisdom with our participants today. And thanks to you, Mark, for your commitment to supporting and elevating small businesses through the workshop, your radio show, and many other endeavors. Fifth Third looks forward to continuing our partnership with you and participating in future small business workshops. Lastly, to all of our participants and attendees for June. Thanks to all of our participants and attendees for joining today. As small business owners, you have weathered a lot of challenges through these past two years. And I appreciate your resilience, your creativity to navigate the pandemic and your ongoing commitment to our region and its communities. Back to you, Mark. 
Tiny Rose, again, thank you very much. Again, uh, you know, Dave Jordan made a comment last week. You hear the consistency in their commitment to small business. In case you're wondering, Dave Jordan is the regional president of Fifth Third for Eastern Michigan region. And Tiny has been a wonderful supporter along with the rest of the Fifth Third team. And I truly mean it when I say we appreciate their support. Today's topic is show me the money. Show me the money. We've heard that for that great but the movie, I think with Tom Cruise, but show me the money. The purpose of this year's workshop is to prepare you for recovery, the road to recovery. And certainly having financial resources to do that are critical. We know that according to surveys, access to capital is always the number one or number two in when, when small businesses are surveyed, generally it's the number one issue that entrepreneurs have. So today's topic, Show Me the Money, will discuss access to capital along with how to get control of your business finances and remove money, uh, remove money blocks so that you can generate more revenue and profit growth. We want those not here today to learn from this experience. Therefore, we're going to rely on you to use social media. To help share today's keys for success, please use social media using the following uh, hashtag, small I see small hashtag small business workshop hashtag small business workshop. Use that hashtag. You can also tag me on Twitter on Twitter Lee Group L E E G R O U P. That's at Lee Group. We'll be more than happy to retweet that. We want so many of us to be exposed to this information that is in fact being shared as possible. Additionally, this event is in fact being recorded, and we want to thank our partners at Detroit Public Television. Well, this is in fact being recorded and will be housed on their YouTube channel, Detroit Public Televisions or DPTV's YouTube channel either later today or first thing tomorrow. And at the end of this session today, uh, you will also have access to a survey. And we, we are asking all of you, if you could, to please complete the survey as well. All right, so I like to do now, we're gonna jump right into the conversation and introduce our very first speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Angelia Sharp, uh, she's a senior loan officer for the Detroit Development Fund, who will discuss access to capital, the Entrepreneur of Color Fund, and the application process. And as I referenced, she is a senior loan officer at the Detroit Development Fund, and she possesses over 30 years of experience in the financial arena. Her passion is coaching entrepreneurs with the proper steps to starting a business, which includes gaining access to capital, and the importance of repayment. If you have questions, please feel free to drop the questions in the Q&A or in the chat, and we will get to the questions as well. Andrea Sharp, good morning, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you, Mark. I wanna say thank you so much for inviting me to be a part, and thank you for Fifth Third for the sponsorship to be able to well, share and provide information um, to our business, to the business owners here in the city of Detroit um, or wherever they may, may be. Uh, I just wanted to just start out and maybe talk a little bit about um, Detroit Development Fund. I am not for certain um, who all is uh, maybe, uh, maybe familiar with our organization. Uh, however, uh, Detroit Development Fund has been around uh, since 1996 and they became um, prevalent or you know, um, got their start with um, Shore Bank of Enterprise um, years ago. And um, Detroit Development Fund is a nonprofit, and uh, we are what we consider as a CDFI, which means a community development financial institution. So what that means is, is that although we are we are a financial institution, we're you know a little different from the, your regular traditional bank, uh, where we have um, you know products and services that we can offer small businesses. However, we don't have the, a lot of the guidelines that the that the banks are kind of um, strict. Um, to or held accountable for, you know, with the federal government. So that de that allows um, Detroit Development Fund to assist small businesses um, with the capital that they need. And not only do we provide the capital, we also provide the coaching that goes along with with that. So because our ultimate goal is to get you um, what we call bankable. So when you come to Detroit Development Fund, if you're able to, you know, to get some capital here to help get your business either started or, or some expansion or what have you, we would refer you to like um, maybe like Fifth Third Bank. Um, and so then you would be able to, you know, we would pre prepare you for that because that is our ultimate goal. So you can have, you know, access to, to the capital through a traditional bank.
Um, the mission, um, we are a mission-driven organization, um, Detroit Development Fund is. So our goal is to um, uh, provide capital to those businesses that are either creating jobs for um, people in Detroit, for Detroiters, or um, for neighborhood revitalization. So what that means is we don't want you just to create jobs. We want you to have more than a like livable wage job. So we want jobs that are going to stick for long term, and that's going to provide a, um, help people to provide a good life for their families. Um, also, um, when with regards to neighborhood revitalization, um, that could be with like maybe commercial buildings, or uh, we have tested the waters a little bit um, on some of the uh, renovations for residential, meaning like if there's a person that, that has a two family flat or a four family flat where you're gonna be um, creating affordable housing. So that is the key is to be able to not just renovate or revitalize the neighborhood, but also be able to provide um, some type of um, um, homes for people that, that are affordable and livable. Um, some of the products and services that, uh, that Detroit Development Funds offers are we have a small business um, regular term loan. And then we also we're, I think we're the only CDFI in this area that offers a, what we call a contractor's line of credit. Um, it just gives some of the details of what we're looking for or you know, how you would um, qualify or, or consider yourself eligible. Uh, we just look for, you know, you have to be in the city of Detroit in order to, um, to have access to the funds for um, from Detroit Development Fund, um, be in business, we say at least for 12 months um, for a loan. However, you know, that could, um, you know, that's the, the joy of being a CDFI is that we have the ability to kind of, um, to kind of tailor products and services, you know, we can take a, some things into account where we can maybe get around that 12 months. So we do, um, we are able to assist businesses that are startups. So I don't want to deter anyone from maybe, you know, inquiring or looking for capital here at Detroit Development Fund. So um, just wanted to let you know that as well. Um, the contractor's line of credit is a great, great product that we offer here at Detroit Development Fund. It's basically mainly for our contractors, whether it's for um, maybe some city, um, uh, city of Detroit contracts. Um, it can help with like maybe some of the janitorials we've been able to, janitorial companies we've been able to assist. Um, we was really huge um, back maybe a few, a few years ago, 2016, 17, when they were, when, um, they were building the queue line. And we had a lot of contractors um, that were able to get some of the work for that. And they were able to do it by having access to the, the contractor's line of credit. So it was really able to help and expand. Even when they were building the new um, uh, arena there, you know, we were able to help some contractors there. That, they got some electrical work um, or they got the plumbing contracts and things of that nature. So it's really, I'm really proud to say that we were able to help a lot of these small businesses that had these contracts. Um, that we would um, we would just use the contract as the um, as collateral for the loan, and we can talk a little bit about that um, either on at the end or you know if sideline if someone wanted to give me a call. It's it's not you know it's pretty simple, um, and I think it's a it's a great again a great way for to help a small business to to increase their revenue, their job market, and things of that nature. Um, the, the small business lending, which means we're referring to like our term loan, um, that can be used, as you can see, for several reasons or several options that you have. You know, it could be working capital for expansion. You may be looking to hire people um, or to, to attract you know, some new contracts. Um, also, equipment financing, um, whether, whether it be, you know, startup, if you're a restaurant, you need some additional equipment. Also, again, talks about the account receivable financing, where you pretty much go into um, where the line of credit, you know, when you get those those contracts up front, we can finance up. We would um, lend up to eighty percent of the contract, and then that way you can get the business going. You know, whether it be to buy materials, uh, whether it be for you know to pay again your 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 um, workers. Um, so for several op you have several options for that. Also, business acquisition. Uh, maybe you may have a new product development that you wanted to to put out. Uh, we can assist with that. Um, the sales expansion, maybe going into a new market. Also, um, we've also been able to help um, clients to improve their system. So we've, you know, they may need to upgrade or add some type of um, software um, to their computer system, which again, would help them to, um, to gain, um, you know, more revenue. 
and we definitely definitely are interested in, in looking at those at those type of um, type of requests. And our loan rates, and that's a, a huge, a huge question that a lot of customers ask is, you know, what are your rates? So our rates are set between seven and eight percent. Um, the rate would typically be based on on the credit score, not so much so um, um, like the banks where you have to have a, a certain credit score. Um, but we do um, we 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 do um, ask questions. We do review credit, and we you know may have questions around that. But the rate can will fall anywhere from between seven and eight percent, and the rates are actually fixed rates, so it's not not tied into prime or anything of that nature where the rate could potentially go up. Um, the contractor line of credit, as I was um, discussing previously, you know, it, it just talks again about, you know, what are the uses and how would that, that product be used for a business and how would it help? Again, if you're a contractor and you, you're working with it, you have a contract with the city of Detroit or maybe the land bank and, you know, they want you to do the rehab and ready program, you know, you may need the materials to, um, you know, to buy the equipment for that because you don't, you don't collect it up front or the customer doesn't purchase that. Um, again, the purchase orders. And again, working capital for DDF means you're looking to pay for um, your, your payroll, is, which is really important. You have to be able to, to have your people and be able to pay them is, is the, the biggest thing that we are finding with a lot of our, our contractors. And then again, you know, having the access to be able to get the materials. Um, and again, the L to be eligible. Uh, again, we want to see that maybe you have at least one to two years of experience um, in the in the industry. Um, have a contract or purchase order to perform the work. But what we're finding is we say that, but a lot of times if you bid on a contract and you don't have the funding in place already, that that will deter a person from even. Um, that were from even um, to, uh, bidding on a contract. So as a lender, my suggestion is if you're, you know, to maybe put something in place, you know, which, you know, we would definitely take a look at putting maybe some type of line of credit in place so that while you're out there bidding on these projects, you know, you're comfortable and you're confident that you have the funds, you know, to be able to, to complete that, that job. So, you know, we want to make sure, you know, that you have that funding. So again, we can also look at that ahead of, you know, ahead of schedule before you actually get the contract. You don't want to bid um, on the contract and then you don't have the funding to fulfill. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, um, we want to make sure that you are employing residents of the city of Detroit to do the, a, a portion, if not a bulk, you know, of the work. So again, all this is all, this all um, centered around the, the city of Detroit. Um, so, you know, sometimes, you know, we get the question asked, you know, well, you know, what type of impact or, you know, what has DDF been able to accomplish here in the city of Detroit? So as you can see, we've been able to um, put, put out over, um, well, $12 million, a little over $12 million on the streets to small businesses, to over 130 small businesses. And that number has actually increased. And we've been able to create 900 jobs thus far. So that number may be up a little as well. We've closed quite a few deals so far um, for this year. And this was a number that was as of the end of 2020. So as you can see, you know, we, we are heavily focused here on the city of Detroit, um, not just you know, you know, with the, the funding, but we also wanna make sure that we're creating jobs and that we're you know, creating um, you know, better neighborhoods, um, things of that nature for the people here in the city of Detroit. So that is our, our biggest focus, one of the, the largest focus, which is why we only um, target the small businesses um, here in the city of Detroit. Um, one thing I, the, um, I always wanna you know, tell um, small businesses to keep in mind is that, you know, yeah, we do offer the, the funding, we do offer um, the loans and things of that nature. But in addition to offering capital, we do offer what we call um, technical assistance. So that can come in, in many forms. Um, in order for us to prepare you for a traditional bank, it's more than just providing the um, the capital. Um, some of the other things that we, we focus on while you're um, while you have your loan with Detroit Development Fund is that we do focus on, you know, reviewing credit. If there's an issue with your credit score, you know, by the time your loan is paid off, we want to make sure that that credit score has increased. So what does that mean? We're looking at your credit score on a, on a semi-annually basis. We do a soft credit. We have meetings. We talk about it. We discuss, you know, uh, where you are, you know, and look at some of the goals and, and where you're trying to go. 
Uh, we also uh, work with, um, there's some things we call reporting requirements. Um, it's done for a couple of different reasons um, with, with regards to like financial statements, for example. So we, we look at your, your financial statements on a quarterly basis. And so what that means is, is that we will look at your, your um, income statement. We want to make sure that you're generating revenue. Uh, we're also looking at your balance sheets to make, ensure that you're keeping the debts down to a minimum, um, that you're not incurring a lot of debt. And hopefully, you know, you're able to, you know, look at your bank accounts and see that that number is increasing in your banks, in your bank statements. Um, it's very, very important for us here at DDL that you are not only, like I said, opening the business, you know, getting the capital, but that you really know your business, meaning if someone was to ask, you know, how's your business doing? You could legitimately um, talk about your, your numbers. You know, I've generated this X amount for revenue. Um, I know what my net income is. Um, you know, those, those are the things that you really want to know about your business, especially when you're going to talk with a lender. So we just want to make sure we try to make sure that you're educated with regards to, you know, to that, that piece of it as well. Um, to start the process here at, at, at DDF, um, the, you would uh, meet with one of the lenders here at the office. And then we use a system where you would download everything. We're trying to go paperless. So we would um, have you send you a link um, to begin the process of submitting your documentation. Uh, we also um, do something what we call um, deal, deal discussion, or what we call pre-screen. So we pre-screen all deals to make sure that it fits our mission. So what that means is, is that we have a, a weekly meeting and all potential deals on the table. That's where we, uh, we have that discussion to make sure that it, you know, it fits the mission of the organization. And then you know, it has a really uh, an impact of, of what we're trying to achieve um, here in the city of Detroit and you know, with the small businesses. So you know, there, there's some things around it, but it's not, again, it's not just providing you with the capital. It's also providing you with the educational piece of it as well. So we do rely on our partners like Fifth Third and you know some of the other organizations here, which um, Fifth Third is a huge supporter here for um, Detroit Development Fund. So we, we do rely on them and, and kind of share back and forth. So whenever they're putting on seminars and things that can be educational for our customers, we definitely like to get you, you know, a part of and into those, some of those type of um, uh, programs over there as well. So we kind of work hand in hand with our, with our partners, you know, to make sure that you have that education. Um, to know to grow your business because for us this is long term it's not short term so also one last thing that I would like to, to, to say that we just want to make sure that you have a business plan and that you have um, projections because that's what we're going to be using especially if you're either a startup or if you're a business that's looking to expand that's how we're going to determine you know whether or not you know that we could get you qualified for some funding here at um, Detroit Development Fund. So um, this is um, pretty much the end of my presentation. Uh, one of the things that I did want to share, one last item, if I could um, pull this up, um, a lot, some of the, um, one of the questions that people want to know is like, you know, well, how would I, you know, start, um, what would I need to apply? So here I'm just, I'm sharing just like um, our checklist of information. And it's pretty standard um, the information that we, that we collect is pretty standard to what your traditional bank would, would ask for. And so people say, oh my God, you know, this is a lot of information. It looks like it's a lot of information, but you'd be surprised because some of the items may not pertain to your business. But again, as your, as your lender, you know, I would walk you through that process hand in hand. You know, at that point, I do become your, what I consider your BFF. Um, you know, we're joined at the hip and my goal is for is, is success for you. So this is some of the information that we, that we do ask for um, during the, the loan process as far as um, submit, submission before we can get you to underwriting. And um, again, it, just, it looks, looks like it's a lot, but really it isn't. And again, we could walk you through that process hand in hand to make sure that you know, everything is there. But um, I know there may be questions at the end, so I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna take any right now and I will be on the, 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 for the duration of this call. So I'll be happy to answer questions. I did have my phone number on the last slide. So if there's a question that you do have or you want to get more details, you can feel free to reach out to me. Andrea, what is it, if you could, if you don't mind, could you drop also your information in the uh, chat room as well? 
Um, Absolutely. You can Absolutely. Stop there. Just put in your website, your phone number, email address, and people. I'll put everything access. in here. So just share. Thank you very much. You're Absolutely. Welcome. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, Angie. We appreciate it, and uh, they've been a wonderful partner and sponsor of the workshop as well. You heard from Ray Waters a few weeks ago, who's the president of the organization. Wonderful people. And this is a nice segue, nice segue into our next conversation. We're talking about finances today, and this entire uh, workshop is focused on show me the money. Angie did a nice job of preparing you. She mentioned your credit score. She mentioned the entrepreneurs of color. Fund, for example. By the way, as an aside, I wrote about that fund a few years ago. If you Google my name, uh, Entrepreneurs of Color Fund in Cranes, Detroit, the article should pop up when it was first introduced in Detroit a few years ago to watch it grow. It's incredible. So this next portion of our program is being sponsored by Build Institute in partnership with GoDaddy, featuring Michelle Mitchell, CEO of Mitchell Consulting, who will discuss how to get control of your business finances and remove money blocks so you can generate more revenue and more profits, something that we all want to do, particularly in these challenging times. Michelle is the owner of Mitchell Consulting, is passionate financial literacy counselor, uh, educator, and she's a brilliant financial strategist. And she uses her skills, education, and experience to help business owners take control of their finances and reach their financial goals. And through Mitchell Consulting, she has helped many businesses increase their operational efficiencies as well as boosting their profits. Again, that's what we're trying to do. So I'm more than pleased to welcome, and I really want to say a special thanks to Michelle. I know she's not quite 100%, so we thank you very much for joining us. But we'd like to welcome Ms. Michelle Mitchell and Bill Institute in partnership with Empowered by GoDaddy for this discussion. Michelle, we'll turn over to you, and thanks for joining us. I think we have Michelle Mitchell should be on screen, please. Michelle Mitchell, are you there? Uh, Tamika. I think we're having some technical difficulty. Hang on one second. I'm asking her to unmute her microphone. Thank you. Hang on. Okay. Here I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank okay. you. You see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for the great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to uh, the Built Institute and uh, GoDaddy for sponsoring this portion of uh, the workshop today. Um, today, I'm going to piggyback off of what Angela talked about a little bit. And uh, she's providing resources for business owners um, you know, to gain the capital that they need to run their businesses uh, and, and to scale and grow their businesses. And my background, I'm, I'm an accountant by trade. So I help small business owners do this on a daily basis. But in today's presentation, we are going to talk about um, how you can effectively use you use some of the knowledge that you have about your business so that you can gain more profits. Um, I've been doing this for 11 years and I am very passionate about um, financial literacy when it comes to um, business owners and how they can maximize their revenues and their profits in their business. And it's a lot of times it's not always about the numbers. It's about the CEO, the business owner themselves and their mindset when it comes to money. So what we're gonna talk about today is how to create a CEO um, mindset about money, gain some clarity about your business and your finances, uh, focus on your money efficiencies and 
uh, I'm going to show you some practical steps on how to create daily habits uh, so that you, the CEO, the business owner, are focusing on the right things in your business so that you can generate more revenue and more profits. And then um, I always talk about uh, finding accountability. Like who are you accountable to for the things that you say you're going to do? And um, I'm just gonna enlighten you on how to find resources to surround yourself um, around people who are in this, trying to do the same thing as you are. Because we all know as entrepreneurs, you know, our families don't really understand um, what we go through on a daily basis with our businesses. So uh, we'll talk about that towards the end. So first off, um, defining a profit. And I looked this definition up in the dictionary and it says to make financial gain. So if we're in business, we are in business to make a financial gain. Um, my definition for profit is to utilize the resources generated in your business to effect to effectively effectively so that you are efficient with your brand your bis, business brand promise. So we all have a promise to either our customers, our community, or our um, employees. And it's up to us, the business owner, to utilize the resources that we have so that we can meet our brand promise. Um, and running, a, running your business with financial responsibility begins with you as the leader. You are the leader of the business and it all starts with you. And the, the thing I um, say often is that when we're the leader, we bring our own money story to the table as a business owner. Um, and I don't care if you are new in business or you've been in business a while, we all have a money story that's related to our past. And we bring that to the table and we bring our money habits that we have in our personal life to our business as well. So some of the things I like to talk to business owners about is their mindset around money and how money affects their approach to, uh, to the money decisions that you have to make in your business. And your money story started as a child, whether there was an abundance of money or scarcity of money. You developed a belief about money. And that belief that you have about money, you are bringing to the table in your business. As the leader of your business, you will need to identify what your money story is and how it is impacting the decisions that you're making about your business. So whether you are looking to invest in your business or you know, add a new piece of equipment, a new location, all of that is impacted on how you perceive yourself with money and what money does for you. So one of the ways uh, to identify how your money story is impacting your decisions about your business is to ask yourself, am I making this decision from a place of abundance or a place of scarcity and fear? One of the things that uh, I see often enough, which, um, Angelia talked about is that we don't have enough capital in our businesses to do the things we need to do. Um, so there's always a situation of there's never enough funds, right? Um, so we always have to be, um, we always have to be thinking about 
where we're going to get the funds we need for our business, how we're going to utilize those funds within our business. And that all comes back to you as the business owner and how you relate to money. And your relationship um, with money uh, affects those this, that decision-making process. So how do you bridge the gap between providing uh, the resources your business needs and actually doing it? How do you bridge that gap? So we're going to talk about that um, a little bit. So your relationship with money, first off, you should understand that money has no life. Money is a tool to help you bring the things that you envision into your business or into your life. So we tell we have to learn how to tell money what to do for us. But what oftentimes happens is we attach an emotion to money and that emotion is based on our past experiences. And those past experiences affects our beliefs about what money can do in our life and in our business. And as the leaders of your organization, your belief and your relationship with money in your personal life is definitely trickling into your business. So how do we um, identify what our money relationship is? Um, and one of the ways I like to do that is to ask yourself, am I putting an emotional attachment to the financial decision that I need to make? Um, I like to understand where that emotional attachment is coming from and then try to break, break it down to uncover why you have attached that emotion to a situation about money. Uh, and, and this is where your money story exercise can come into play. One of the things I do with my clients is to have them go through an exercise to really understand and uncover how, their belief about money. And once you understand your belief about money, then we can stop, start breaking down your fears about money, your hesitancy about money. Uh, once you understand that, uh, you can make better decisions about how you're going to utilize uh, funding within your business. Um, because when we go to make investment decisions, about our business, we are leaning on our personal, um, our personal beliefs. And my suggestion would be to you to then ask yourself, how can I gain the resources I need from a place of abundance instead of you know the fear and lack that most people um, really approach a money decision about. So this is more of having a, an abundant mindset about money and really trying to figure out how you can utilize the tools that you already have and become creative about what you can do with the resources you already have and to solve the problem that is facing your business today from a place of um, abundant mindset rather than scarcity and fear. So some of these things come to us because of our habits that we have created for ourselves uh, in our life. And as the leader of your business, your personal money habits are trickling down into the organization uh, into your business organization. Therefore, I say that uh, you should be putting processes and systems in place so that you can begin to develop new money habits 
in your business. So one of the things that um, I help my clients with is to teach them how to regularly review their money handling processes in their organizations. Whether you are the solopreneur and you're doing it all on your own, or you have someone that does it for you, it is your responsibility as the owner and the leader to develop the process for how the money transactions will flow through your business. And we do this by creating a process and a system for you to do that. Um, one of the things uh, that I find a lot with entrepreneurs is that um, most of the time you're in one or two camps. Either you never want to deal with any money issues at all, and you try to put it off to someone else's responsibility, or you are obsessive about making any little money decisions that need to be made in your uh, business. So people are, are in are one extreme or the other. You can sometimes find a few that are kind of in the middle, but when you put processes in place for handling the money in your business and then regularly reviewing those routines, then you can take start to, to take the emotion out of the money decisions in your business. So create creating routines, we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the presentation. But uh, one of the things is just to continue as the leader to develop your knowledge base about money and what and how how you are personally affected by money and how you personally make money management decisions within your business. Um, and I like to say, um, you know, seek out the information that you need as a business owner, because these are things that we are not taught in school. So, you know, listen to podcasts, read books on money management, attend workshops like this one, so that you can begin to improve the money management systems within your business. So to recap this section, uh, one, uncover your money story and what your money story is and really understand how that's Im impacting your decision-making process. And then commit to making small little changes so that you can make, have a big impact over the long run in your business with your finances. And then I always suggest that um, business owners surround yourself with other like-minded business owners around you because we're all going through the same things, but we're at um, where we may be at different levels. And then just to continue uh, to improve your personal develop development when it comes to money and money management. Uh, that is your responsibility. If you want your business to become successful, it is the owner's responsibility to do that and make those personal development changes. Um, and it will begin to trickle down into your organization. All right, so the next section we'll talk about is gaining clarity. Um, I find that this topic right here is really the most important because what, when you are a CEO of a business and you get, be, become clear about what your business is about, who you are serving within your business and how you are serving your customers within your business, once you uncover what this is, it has a huge impact on your life. So as a business owner, sometimes um, we are doing all the things, right? We, you know, we're the janitor, we're the salesperson, we're the accountant, we're everything. 
And when you become clear about what you want your business to do, that's how you begin to step into the CEO role of your business instead of the worker in your business all the time. And you are doing all the hat, all the things within your business. So uh, discovering why you're doing this and then how is this going to impact you personally and how is it going to impact your family? Because you as the CEO, are you working 80 hours a week and you never have time uh, for the quality of life things that you want in your business? Um, quality of life things you want in your life? Um, do you always hear uh, you're working too much or you're doing too much? When you begin to become clear about what, what you want, who are you serving, what you're serving them, then you, be, you can begin to develop your organization so that you the, you, the owner, are focusing on the things that's going to have the higher level impact for your business. And then you'll know what you can say yes to and what you can say no to. And one of the ways that um, I like to do this with uh, business owners is to help them create a vision. This is a vision for the future of your business. So some of the things that Angela talked about getting funding or capital that you need for your business, it is so that in five years, that thing has come true. But you got to know what you need to work on in order for that five-year vision to come true. So how do you develop that, bit, that vision? Um, is this just asking yourself a bunch of questions about how big do I want my business to be? How many employees do I want to have? You know, how many hours do I personally want to be working in the business versus on the business? You know, what revenue streams am I going to have within this business? You know, uh, what financial position do I want to be in in five years? So as the CEO of the business, it is your job to figure out what that looks like in five years. Then you begin to direct your organization in that way so that those things will actually come true and, and what you have envisioned comes true. So I do this exercise um, with clients called your ideal day. So I just tell them to pick a day five years in the future and just go through your day and think about what are you doing? Who are you doing it with? How are you serving your clients? Uh, who's on your team? Who is your right-hand person? You know, what does that physically look like in your mind's eye? Because what you can envision, then we can begin to make a plan for that to come true. So once you have your vision uh, set and you begin to identify who you are serving. This is the who. These are the customers in your business. These are the clients in your business. This is the uh, audience that you may have that you're impacting in your business. This would be your employees as well. And then of course yourself, you're serving yourself as, as well because you set out in this business to have a financial gain. Um, so what are um, the needs of your organization to get you to the results uh, that your client is going to need or your customer is going to need? And then identifying resources that you need to make it come true. Uh, what are the resources? How are you going to get that? Um, it is your responsibility as the owner of the business to figure these things out. Um, and then what are the services? What are the product lines are you gonna have in your business? 
um, that's going to serve the needs of these customers that you're serving. And it's your responsibility to really dive in and understand not only who that customer is, but how can your product and what you do give them the best result? And when you begin to identify how you can deliver the best result to the client, that's where value comes in. And the value that you offer the client for solving whatever problem that they have, that's what they're paying for. And that in turn um, comes to pricing. How are you setting your prices in your business? And when you know that you're delivering the right product to the right people to get the right result, they will pay for your, your services that you offer or your product that you offer in your business. And once you know all of these things and you're clear on the direction to generate more revenue and more profit in your business that you're looking for. And now you know when an opportunity comes to you, you know what you can say yes to and you know what you can say no to because you are clear about what you're delivering to your customer and the value that you're delivering to them for the price point you're asking them to pay. So to recap, some of the strategies to gain clarity um, as a CEO is to un uncover your why. Why are you doing this in the first place? And then envision your future state. Because once you know where you're going, then you can put a plan in place on how to get there. And then um, once you do that, you can identify your uniqueness in the marketplace. And this is the value translation uh, to the end customer. How you're translating your value is a unique way compared to your competitors, right? And this is where you can create margin in your pricing because your customers are paying for the value that you're giving them. And CEOs are clear about the direction that their organization is moving in. So you, the CEO, whether you are a solopreneur or you have a full-blown team, it is your responsibility to set the direction for how the company is going to move forward in the next five years. So now, so how do we practically do this, right? Um, as a business owner, we do a lot of things. So how do you gain focus in your business? And you, the CEO, need focus more than anyone. Um, it's you who are who is mapping out the pathway to get you to that five-year mark and uh, what you want to accomplish in that five years. And if I may suggest that creating a plan to do this is, is the way you're going to practically get it done. And some of the, um, each year, businesses set goals, right? And if you set goals for your business, I like to say create a 90-day plan because in 90 days, you can measure you know, how far you've come. So take that big overarching plan that you have for the year and break it down into 90-day increments. And as the leader of the organization, you need to be able to determine what you need to focus on so that your business is actually moving forward. And in that 90-day increment, um, in 30, 60, 90 days, you can see how you are moving towards completing a goal. Um, so I like to focus on 90 days. It's a quarter. Um, at the end of the quarter, we review financials. We see where we are. We look at where we've been and we look at uh, where we're going uh, in that. And as the business owner, 
This also allows you the ability to set boundaries within your day, right? So if you have a 90 day plan, you know what your top three things you're working on. You know what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so then as so a practical tactic is to create systems so that you do these things on a regular basis. And I would suggest the 90 day plan is the way that you do that um, and create efficiencies within your business. So the more money you have available or, or little money that you have available, it's for you, the business owner, to identify um, how that's going to be impacted uh, throughout your business. And when you focus on the things that matter most um, are the things that the CEO does. Uh, and one of these things is to create systems and efficiencies. Uh, and one of the systems is to create that 90 day plan for yourself and then to manage your time so that you are utilizing the time you have available to make the biggest impact in your business. Now to maximize your resources. So as business owners, um, we need to maximize all the revenue that is coming into our businesses. We need to keep an eye on our profit margins. So our profit margins are the difference between the the revenue that comes in and what it costs you to provide that product or service to the customer. So you as the business owner need to keep an eye on what those profit margins are because you want to be able to use the resources that you're gaining from the revenue that's coming into your business in a, in a real way so that so you're not being wasteful, you're not being, you're not overspending. Um, you're keeping tabs on, um, you know, the money in and the money out in your business. You're not overspending on things that you don't need. A lot of times I find that um, some business owners say, well, I can write that off. But just because you can write it off, does it mean that you actually need it in your business? And I would suggest that you would need a tax strategy versus trying to write off like uh, personal items that uh, yes, technically are could be part of your business deductions, but not necessarily because it, it affects the efficiency of the money that you have to work with within your business. So maximizing your resources in your business, uh, the funds that are available to do the things that you need to do. It's your responsibility as the CEO to be able to do that. And one of the ways that I like to teach um, people to do uh, create good money habits is through what I call CFO days. And you are the CEO of your business, but you are also the chief financial officer of your business. So this is where those money habits can um, and those money beliefs come into play because you are the CFO of your business. And the CFO day is uh, a, at least one day every couple weeks um, that I suggest you have that's set aside on your calendar for you to do the money things in your business. This is a good time for you to review your money resources. This is a good time to review any um, invoicing or payments that you need to process. This is a good time to make those bank deposits because the sooner money gets into your business, the more effective it can be in helping you run your business because cash is king. If you don't have enough cash to run your business, you will soon be out of business. So setting aside the, this CFO day will help you focus on just the money part of your business and making sure if 
you have someone else on your team that does the money function, you as the CEO still need to understand what those money things are in your business and making sure that um, all deposits are made and all payments are going out uh, in a timely fashion. And I would suggest that you keep this date with yourself uh, on your calendar and not let anybody move this date because it is very important for your business and the success of your business. So keep that date with yourself um, in that CFO day. So just to recap, um, in this focus section, um, creating your 90-day plan so you know as the CEO what you need to be focusing on um, every 30, 60, 90 days so you can see how you are progressing in your business. Establishing good money routines and commit to your CF, doing those money routines in your CFO day. And as the CEO, you know what to focus on in those 90 days, in those 30, 60, 90 day uh, goals that you have for yourself. Um, so this is a practical way for you to really um, take some time out as the CEO, have your CFO days and review any of the money routines in your business. Now, the next step is your daily habits. So practically, and, and this is where people, uh, business owners uh, need help with, how do I practically do that? And I call them my top three priorities. So for me in my business, and this is what I teach my um, audience to do as well, is to, of your, in your 90 day plan, what are your top three priorities that you, the CEO, need to get done today? And you need to protect your time to get those top three things done in your day. I know as a business owner myself, my to-do list is way too long. And I know that your to-do list is way too long. So I start my day with my top three priorities because these are the things that I am the only one that can do those things. Everything else on my list should be delegated to someone else on your team. And if you're not there yet, you will get there. Um, someone else on your, on your staff can do the things that you don't need to do on a daily basis. So set your top three priorities, delegate the things that don't need to be on your plate and um, create a routine for yourself uh, to do these top three priorities. And when you're delegating the other tasks to anybody else on your team, be a good CEO and give them all the information that they need to do the task. Um, tell them what the outcome of that, and then give them the permission to go ahead and do the task. So that's how you will, will alleviate some of that long to-do list that you have in your business um, to someone else that can help you uh, get those other things done. And um, I know this, this is a lot, but I wanna just say, take baby steps. Don't overwhelm yourself. Do one of these things um, on a daily basis that will help move the needle in your business, help move the finances forward in your business. So take small baby steps. Don't get overwhelmed. Stay committed to change, changing yourself as the CEO. And when you fall off of doing your routine, don't worry about it. Just do it again the next day um, because we, we all do that, right? We get overwhelmed and we get off task, but just refocus and go back to it the next day. And then a lot of times what um, I like to do is to celebrate the wins because as entrepreneurs, 
we don't get to celebrate our successes enough. And one of the one of the things that can keep you fueled and to keep you going to generating um, more revenue and more profit in your business is to celebrate your wins. And one of the things I like to ask myself on a daily basis uh, at the end of the day is what went well today? What do I need support on? And what am I looking forward to tomorrow? So these are some of the questions that I ask myself to keep myself on task because it can be a lot and it can be overwhelming, but you are in control. You are the business owner and you get to dictate what that looks like. Um, so celebrate your wins uh, because you, you deserve to do that. And when you're documenting those wins each day, then when you look back over your 30 days, you can see the progress you're actually making in your business. Now, just to recap some of the strategies for creating daily habits is to focus on your, your priorities first, your CEO priorities first. Create systems to develop your new habits. Um, create routines. Set priorities for your day the night before. So when you get up in the morning, you already know what you're supposed to be working on. And at the end of the day, um, reflect on, on your reflection questions. What went well today? What do you need support with? And what are you looking forward to tomorrow? And CEOs of large corporations and small, CEOs have routines and their routines direct them towards success. Now, the last section is accountability. And I like to talk about um, accountability because we as business owners need a support system. We need to surround ourselves with other business owners. We need to hear what they're going through because you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, someone else has gone through what you're experiencing right now. So I say, create your own support system. Um, become, you know, get involved with different groups where other entrepreneurs are. Find a mentor that can help you move your business along and who can be objective in your business to create um, a person that is going to help you stay on task for the goals that you have set um, so that you can reach those financial goals, so that you can reach that uh, five-year future that you have already envisioned. And, you know, if you can get a coach because they will help you stay on task. The other thing is to uh, involve your other stakeholders. So if you have a team uh, that you work with, then share the vision with them, get them to buy in to what you're trying to do, because they are the ones that are actually executing the actual tasks within the business um, and, and bringing them into the fold and letting them know uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Tell them what your financial goals are. Don't keep them in the dark about that because your, your team are the ones that are going to help you get there. And when you create that culture within your, your business, then it's easier for your employees to have buy-in on the tasks that you have asked, asked them to accomplish because they see the bigger vision. And it all boils down to you as the owner creating more money, more revenue, more profit in your business for your business, but also for yourself. And um, so in, involve your stakeholders, involve your team, uh, create the culture within your business so they know where you're trying to go and, and tell them the updates, give them where you, where you stand. It's nothing wrong with sharing that information. So for accountability, here are some of the strategies, um, practical strategies that you can do 
to create accountability, one, find a mentor or coach that can help you stay on task as the leader of your organization um, so that you can see the growth in your business. And then implement changes in your personal growth. Because being a CEO is all about you and how you're developing and changing um, yourself so that you can become a better leader, so that you, you, you know what to focus on when you're generating more revenue. You know what to focus on when generating more profit. And to con continue to learn and develop uh, as you go as a leader, because this is, this is a project for you, uh, yourself, to develop into that CEO and have the CEO mindset to grow your organization, increase profits, and increase um, your revenue. So uh, that's, that's what I have, Mark. Uh, that's, uh, that's the end. Um, of my presentation, and I am open for questions. Um, this is my contact information if you guys want to uh, reach out. Um, but thank you so much for allowing me to present today. Of course, and in fact, what I'd like to do, Angelia, if you can also uh, show yourself as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing, okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Evangelia as well and Michelle, thank you both. Um, we're going to, you know, we're going to go for a few more moments, ask a few questions of both of you. Thank you very much for the information. I mean, uh, I love what you said. It's a refresher for me as well. You know, it's a refresher. <laughs> but we do have a question. Uh, do you have a suggestion for employees who see the sales revenue, sales slash revenue, but don't see the cost of maintaining the business and have a distorted view of, of the financial side of things. Right. Um, so it's up to you as the leader um, to inform them, right? It's up to you to inform the employees of the state of the business. So you can have, um, you know, you can have a meeting once a year and, talk, you know, do a recap of what happened. My suggestion would be to maybe do it quarterly. Um, to let the employees know, because you have to get their buy-in in order for them to execute the task that you're asking them to do and for them to fulfill their responsibilities as a, as a worker. So you, it's, it's up to the CEO's discretion of what to share, but I would suggest sharing it so, so you're all moving the boat in the right direction. Yeah. And a question regarding uh, personal, and, and Angelia, I will engage you as well. It's your response. Talk about the co-mingling <laughs> of, per right, of personal finances with your business finances. Hey, I'm just starting a business. Do I use my personal accounts? Do I have business accounts? Talk about the co-mingling mm -hmm. of, of personal finances with business finances. Angelia? Yes, absolutely. You. And so I don't know if, if um, anyone had an opportunity to take a real look at that checklist and if you notice we do ask for your most re um, recent two to three months of personal bank statements as well as um, the, the, the uh, bank statements for the business and that is the absolute reason why we'd like to ensure and make sure that you have those accounts separate and you want it for, for accounting purposes um, the um, IRS may reach out or what have you. You want to be able to, to show and have a, a, an accountability for how funds were spent for the business and that the funds are actually were used for the business and not for your personal your personal gain. You know, your debit card. We see all of that. You out at the jewelry store or you may be at Walmart or, you know, we see all that in the target purchases. You don't want that on there. Um, it is so important and it's very, very key that not only that you're keeping that separate, even for your own, like for your own personal self, make sure you're on payroll as well. You want to see that check that's that's being cut from the business as and then depositing into your personal. That is the, the main purpose that you want, the reason that you want to keep that separate. You don't want anyone to question um, how funds are being utilized for the business. And especially if you're in a partnership with someone, you know, we've got this partner say, oh, they're using funds for their personal use. And, you know, it's just, it's very, very key to keep for accounting records and the usage of funds for the business to keep it, um, to keep that separate. And I'm sure Michelle probably 
can probably preach about that <laughs> for, yes. you know, for a good a good reason, a let's good get, long time get, about that as an accountant let's get, CPA. Let's give Michelle an opportunity to respond, Michelle. I'm gonna add, add on to it. Absolutely. So you should keep your personal and business finances completely separate, especially if you are trying to go for funding, um, especially if you're, you know, you're trying to grow your business. Um, some businesses or business owners have a cash flow issue and they have a cash flow issue because they're utilizing the resources of the business for their personal life by swiping that debit card. Mm -hmm. You know, how much of your profits is actually sitting in your closets? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you should be an employee of the business and receiving a regular paycheck. And I'm not saying that you can't take a distribution from the business, you absolutely can't. That is your right as a business owner. But that money should be pulled out of the business and put into your personal account so that you're not commingling funds. And Angela is right. When banks or the IRS looks at that and you have pierced the veil of your legal entity, then all bets are off, right? Um, then you open yourself up to personal liability as well as the business liability. So that yeah. is key. And along that line, let's talk about the impact of personal slash business. Talk about the impact of the credit score um, mm. and as it relates to you getting financial support for your business. So does your personal credit score affect your ability to fund or get a loan for your, your business? Uh, Michelle, we'll start with you. Yes, it does affect your ability to get a loan for the business because um especially banks, they tend to look at your credit, your personal credit score first, even if you do have a, a business credit developed, um, they tend to look at because they want to see how are you relating to money, people? How are you relating to money in your personal life? If you're mishandling money in your personal life and your credit score is affected, then they know it's going to trickle into the business. It's just a known so you have to get your, if you have an issue with your personal credit, my suggestion is to get it in order. Take some of these steps I've given you today, like the CFO day, handle your money, handle your money because it is impacting your business and your ability uh, to get capital. Angela, would you like to add on? Yes, um, I, what I would add, um, Michelle is, is so so correct and true. But what I would like to add is, you know, knowing your credit score is, is very key. Uh, you, the, one of the reasons that we do ask and, and pull credit is the fact that we, um, you're going to be the personal guarantee. The, you know, you got to personally guarantee that loan. That just means that if the business cannot at some point support that debt, that you're going to um, ensure that that payment is, is made. And so we want to make sure that if you're, if you're handling your personal credit right, then we know that you're going to, you know, do what's right and try to make sure and ensure that that loan is paid, paid in full. Uh, so yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you're, that you're keeping track of that and you, you know your score. Uh, the, the joy of DDF, again, as I had indicated before, is that we don't have a minimum score. But one thing that I really would want to say to, um, to an applicant or a business owner when you're applying for credit, because an organization like DDF or Detroit Development Fund, we don't necessarily have a, a minimum credit score, but we do look at it. We have conversations and talk about it. We are looking for you to, to um, increase that score over the time of your loan, but make sure that you don't have open collections and things out there when you're going to apply for a loan. Um, mm. Because um, that can hamper, will hamper your ability um, to uh, obtain a loan. But anywhere, there's no, there's not any or very, very, very few organizations out there that's going to provide any, um, any additional credit or loans with people that have open collection accounts out there. So again, know, know what's there and know your, know your credit scores. Question for the audience uh, is about, it's for DDF, uh, Angelia. For those who aren't familiar, is there a style, excuse me, is there a style of business plan preferred? And is there a resource that you can suggest in terms of business plan development? Absolutely. There is no particular style. The only style we don't like is those 50 pages. 
<laughs> we are only going to, I'm going to tell you now, we are only going to review the pertinent parts. So there's no particular um, like format that we use. We just like to see that you're using, that you're covering the, the, the necessary information that we're going to be looking at, you know, meaning, you know, it could be, you know, the, co the company history, we definitely want to know about the owner, their team, who's going to be helping to manage the day to day, um, who, uh, who are your competitors, you know, knowing who your competitors are. If, if, if someone wanted to reach out, my information is out there, I'd be happy. We do have a, um, a format that we do send out to customers or potential customers that do not have a business plan. So I would be happy to share that with you. But we don't need 40 or 50 pages. They're nice and pretty with the, with the dividers and all that, but we're only going to cover what we need to get the loan done. So no, we don't have, we do not have a, a particular format. When I tell my uh, students, as you all know, I'm an educator as well, is the average attention span for an adult is less than 30 seconds. Actually, that's not even true anymore. The average attention span of an adult, you ready? You ready? Seven seconds. It's actually less than that of a goldfish. A goldfish's <laughs> attention span is eight seconds. Look at a goldfish, they swim around, they come up to the glass, they'll stare at you for like eight seconds. Our attention span is actually less than that. And so what Angelia is saying is, you know, she wants she wants the hard facts and the information that they can go through. You know, the old days when I was a lot younger and coming out of business school at Northwest University in Chicago, I had to write those long pages, those long documents, but time has certainly evolved over time. Um, Michelle, is there anything that you want to add from your perspective? Yeah, from my pers yeah, from my perspective, um, to me, the business plan is for the owner, is for you to hash out like those uh, key things in your organization, like who do you need in your organization? Like, like what are you spending the money on? Like, mm -hmm. how are you going to grow? What do you need for growth? So all those details to create your forecast uh, is needed. The business owner needs to understand that on how mm -hmm. to get there. Because when you go to a loan officer, uh, they want to see how you're going to get there. Show me the numbers, right? Show me the numbers. How are you going to get there? So the business owner needs to think through all of those different areas in the business plan, but they really only want like, how you how you paying us back? That's it. That's, that's, that's it. it. That's it. Absolutely. How you Absolutely. Yeah. Well, okay, as we wrap up, uh, I want to give uh, Angelia and Michelle 30 seconds each for any final comments. I'll have some closing comments. Uh, and before we do that, yes, um, uh, this, this, this Detroit, this will, this video, this Zoom session will be available two ways. One, it will be available on Detroit Public Television's YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and type in Detroit Public TV Small Business Workshop. Later today or tomorrow morning, you will find a repository of this year's workshops, even going back to last year's workshops. So, yes. Number two, if you are invited by an organization, for example, they will also have access to the YouTube link. And so feel free to reach out to them to get the link. Number three will also be posted on my social media sites. If you don't follow me on LinkedIn, please do. My LinkedIn is Mark S. Lee. As I referenced earlier, my Twitter feed is Lee Group. That's Lee Group. And uh, also my Facebook page is Mark S. Lee. I always use my middle initial, obvious reasons, because my name is so common. So again, the, you will have access to all this information. Please feel free to share. All right, before we uh, wrap up for today, um, let's see here. Let's start with you, Michelle. 30 seconds for final comments. Sure. My final comments is just that, you know, you as the business owner, you wear a lot of hats in your business, but your money is very important. So for you to get an understanding of how you are relating to money so that you can make the best decisions in your business is paramount. Um, and then creating those money routines. Um, how you how you handle money in your personal life and in your business. You got to get some good money habits going. Uh, I just encourage you to um, take some of these tips I, 
I've given you, implement one or two. I guarantee you they will make a difference in your revenue and in your profits. Outstanding, Angelia. Thank you. Go ahead, Angelia. How sure, about just, you? 30 seconds? Sure. Mm -hmm. Just a couple things to leave you with. Um, just remember that um, the documentation that you're provided, uh, make sure that, you know, that it's filled out as completely as possible and make sure that all signatures are there on those documents. Um, the information is there. We're asking information because obviously it's information that we need to make a decision. So keep that in mind. And then also know, know your credit. If there's if you have open collection out there, make sure that you're handling that and you have something in place or you're working on it. Um, it's easier for us to make a case when, you are, when you've paid a collection account as opposed to having a collection account open on the books. Outstanding. Well, I got to tell you, I want to thank again, I want to thank Angelia excuse me, and Michelle for a wonderful discussion today. Show me the money. I mean, this was so important to me. I'm actually supposed to be up at the Mackinac Policy Conference <laughs> covering, but I'm covering the Mackinac long distance. I have all the, all the press releases are being sent to me from Mackinac. As you know, the Mackinac Policy Conference is going on, but I wanted to be here to run this. This is important because I, I have such a commitment to this, this, this type of business, entrepreneurship, because it's important for all of us to be successful. And so as we wrap up, I do want to say this. Um, it's humbling for me because as I reference, this is our eighth annual, our eighth annual. We watched you grow and the numbers this year just, just exploded through the roof. And so I'd like to take, thank, uh, thank the audience for your attendance and your participation today, as well as over the last four weeks, we've actually had over five hours of instruction and we have selected specific topics tied into the recovery. The recovery. We know the numbers are going back up ever so slightly. We know that we still need to remain vigilant, but we also know it's vital that small businesses remain vital because small businesses are the economic generators in this country as well as across Detroit as well. Again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors uh, and partners for their support. Um, again, we, we listed them, but I'd like to get so again one more time. Fifth Third Bank, Detroit Development Fund, the Comcast Business, Bill Institute, who sponsored today's session in partnership with Empowered by GoDaddy, First Independence Bank. I also want to thank Live Six Alliance. If you have not been over to Liverdoy in Six Mile, uh, look at the investments that are taking place over there. It's phenomenal to see what's happening in that whole corridor. That's what the Live Six Alliance is. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank our partners, Michigan Women Forward, um, State Farm Agent Cindy Fletcher, Tanner Freeman, Strategic Communications Organization, Detroit Public Television, and of course the Detroit Free Press. You see, we have a diverse group of partners, diverse group of sponsors. We've got a diverse group of speakers. That's my objective. That's our objective. We want an audience. We want our speakers and everyone to reflect the audience that we serve. And we know what type of audience that the city of Detroit has and metropolitan Detroit of 5 million people has. We want to make sure that we totally represent everyone that's engaged. I would also like to take this opportunity. You've heard, always heard his voice every once in a while. I may say, Tamika, Tamika, what's going on? And she's with uh, the event management group, RSVP Premier Group. I'd like to thank them for their patience with me and for making sure that we've had smooth, for the most part, very smooth events for the last four weeks. They're outstanding professional team. I've enjoyed working with them as well. We've completed our second year. Yeah. Uh, we've completed our second year together as well. So thank you to RSVP Premier Group uh, here in Metro Detroit. I think specifically out of Detroit, Michigan. Again, we want you to we want you to, uh, to complete the survey uh, that will be sent out later today. And and the reason for that is I review all of them. The RSVP and I review all the surveys. We've gotten some great responses, great feedback. We thank you. But we have a question that we're asking too. One of the very last questions, as you know, we've done this virtually for the last three years. The first five years, I did it down in Midtown. And so the question becomes, we don't know what's gonna happen a year from now. We have no idea. But the question is something along the lines of looking ahead, would you prefer this workshop to continue to be virtual or would you consider, or you know, I get to see us back face to face. And so we certainly wanna have those types of conversations. All right, so again, thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate all of you for joining us. Uh, you can check me out. I will be back on the radio this weekend. So last weekend off, obviously, because of Memorial Day. So you can check me out at 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation for In the Conference Room with Mark Esley. I have a great lineup of guests this weekend. That's called a tease. So I'm not going to tell you it's going to be on, but make sure you check it out. You can also check me out periodically on Fox 2 News and 
and uh, other other things I do here in Detroit, as well as Channel 56, American Black Journal, amongst other things I do. All right, you all, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. You are very special to me. Go out and make it a great day. Have a great summer, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everyone.